the organizers. I'm having a wonderful time in Bath. It's a nice change from San, sunny San Diego. So I'm going to talk about this instability. And this is, it says joint work with Laurent Lacaz, who's in Toulouse. We're really starting off, so I'm not going to talk much about what we've done together. My normal base of operations is San Diego, a very sunny place. So there's a rather wide range of people in the audience, and I'm going to try and be somewhat pedagogical, and maybe I won't get to the new stuff, but that doesn't matter. Um, I'll try and tell you a bit about this instability. So my main area of research is fluid mechanics and instability, vortex dynamics. And I'll talk to you a bit about why, why we're interested in this problem, uh, with maybe some examples in the real world, so that might be fun. Uh, then talk a bit about this instability, formally how one comes across it, what the background is. And then the two things I'd like to talk about in particular are the question of what I call the non-infinitesimal strain, and I hope I'll make that clear as I go on, and then the initial value problem. And I should say that this is all rather preliminary, and one of the reasons I particularly appreciate coming here is it got me to escape from my home institution for four days, and therefore do the work of this talk. And at the end, some conclusions and further perspective. So I'll start off with a pretty picture. This is, uh, these are whales, uh, and they're in an aquarium in Japan, in fact. I've forgotten where. Hamada, I don't know what that is. It's a lovely picture. And in fact, it's from a very nice New York Times article about Japanese investment to get around the um, recession. Mm. Not about bubble rings, but um, you can see these beautiful bubble rings. Um, and dolphins and whales do this for fun in the aquarium. In, um, they make these and they can control them, and I'll discuss that right at the end. So this is just my pretty picture to get onto vortex rings. And vortex rings are a lovely thing. You can play with them myself at home with a cigar in a cardboard box, although I don't smoke cigars. Uh, Keith Moffat used to do the experiment. You can also buy gadgets, which will produce a rather impressive vortex ring. I might have one of these, but I don't like taking it on the plane because uh, TSA <laughs> people have no sense of humor. It looks like a rather strange device. Um, it works very well, actually. It makes also funny spaceship ray gun noises. Uh, this is the rather bigger model, which I don't have. Now, that's nice, but uh, that's not really terribly quantitative. And there are people who do very beautiful experiments on vortex rings. And there are some wonderful experiments by T.T. Lim's group in Singapore. And I thought I'd show them because they're really so, so pretty. So here's an experiment. So here's a, it's a tank. Oh, it's, and so you see the two vortex rings colored in ink come in, spread out. That's self-induced, vorticity, and then break up into rather dramatic azimuthal instability. And in fact, it's not worth seeing it that size. It's too small. Show that once again for fun. Here we go, vortex ring has come in, I hit that bar, and it comes out, they spread apart, and sudden dramatic explosive instability. <coughs> so that's a good picture, and here's another one, it's rather bigger, slightly high Reynolds number, in they come, shoot mm -hmm. apart. The, the effect here is very simple, it's just essentially image vorticity, and the ring spreads out and tries to conserve its circulation. So you can do rather better than cigars and boxes. So there is instability, which is very evident, and for a number, in fact, for a number of historical reasons, in the 1970s, there was quite a lot of work on this instability of vortex rings. There are also famous experiments due to Maxworthy. And one approach, and there are many different ways of looking at this problem, um, due to Wynne, Bliss, and Sight, among others, was to argue that for this thin vortex ring limit, as you saw when the vortices came close together and became bigger, they eventually get a very narrow core. What you're seeing is a narrow filament of vorticity, so if its thickness is much less than the of curvature, it's almost straight. And what is it seeing? Well, it's an essential irrotational fluid around it, so any disturbance looks like a strain. So basically, you're saying what happens to a vortex filament and strain, and it's pretty clear, clear that it goes unstable and explodes. And so one approach for this instability question is what happens to a vortex and a strain field. So that's sort of a canonical question which you could try and apply to the vortex ring problem. There are many other approaches. There are short wavelength analyses due to Fukumoto and Hattori, among others, which think about what happens to a small wavelength perturbation. And then there's a sort of kitchen sink approach where you write everything down in bipolar coordinates, and it's extremely messy. So part of the motivation of my talk and for this instability is to understand structures like vortex rings. Now, there's another application which is maybe a bit more technological, and this is something that we see all the time in the sky. And so you see aircraft go by, they leave a nice contrail, which essentially is the wake due to the wingtips visualized by ice crystals. And these weights are quite important in a commercial sense because you don't want to get into them if you're a small plane. If you're an Airbus A380, you quite happily fly along. And if you're a small plane behind it and you come across the wake of this Airbus, you'll be flipped over, which you don't want to do. It's very dangerous. 
And so, in fact, airports have strict rules about spacing between aircraft, which essentially is a safety-based requirement. And as yet, there are no, there are no systems, operational systems in airports to measure these weights behind aircraft. They just have a set distance. There have been programs by the FAA and European agencies to actually understand the aircraft weight problem. In fact, Stefan and Pippin Toulouse have been Toulouse has been involved in those, but there's no operational devices, I believe. So this wake, here's another example. This, I'll tell you where this comes from. You want the wake to go away, and so, in fact, these vortex wakes do break down, and they don't break down by a viscous mechanism, which would be very slow. They break down essentially by instability, and there's a long discussion of these kind of vortex filament instabilities in Saffron's book, which is very rich. And there are three kinds of instability. And the first one's called the Crow Instability, named after Crow, who looked at this in the early 1970s. And this is from his original paper. He visualized two vortex wakes, and Stefan showed a similar picture in the DLR tunnel. And it goes unstable. And this is an example of what happens afterwards in the sky. These two nice parallel contrails have become broken up. And this is from a NASA or an FAA report about the crash of Flight, flight 587, which, for those of you who remember, was a flight that took off from New York LaGuardia Airport in September 2001 and crashed on the way to a Caribbean island, no survivors. The analysis of the crash implied that the aircraft had encountered unexpected turbulence due to the weight of a previous aircraft and had essentially overridden the parameters of the aircraft and the tail fell off, basically. So there was no way they could get out of that one. But you can see discussion in the report from the National Transportation Safety Board of the potential this evidence for this weight behind it. So this is a specific problem. The two other instabilities, in Saturn's terminology, are the shortwave cooperative instability and the ultra shortwave cooperative instability. And this essentially is the question about a vortex column having modes on it, and these are the modes that Stefan talked about, being coupled and being driven to instability in a straining field. And this is from a review paper by Jacquin, which shows a picture from Le Dizès and Laporte, which is only important in the context of showing that I have here current to the dipole, so it's like two vortex filaments showing clearly waves on it, and then these going unstable become more complicated. This is just an example. I don't want to try and do anything more with it. The final instability is this ultra short wave instability, sometimes known as the elliptical instability, which is a very generic mechanism linked to elliptic streamlines. And that really started off in the 80s with Pierre Humbert and Bailey's work. There's been a lot of work since then. I refer you particularly to the review article by Kurzweil in annual reviews, and people since then have had spent a lot of time trying to clarify the physical mechanisms and adding other physical effects, such as magnetic field strength occasion and so on. So the plan here is to talk about this shortwave cooperative instability, talk a bit about the original historical analysis and the questions that it led me to pose. Okay, so here we go. I've called this Cywood Normal Saffron because of these are names usually associated with it in various papers. Um, I should explain in one slide the mechanics. This is maybe a tall order. Essentially, I'm thinking about inviscid fluid mechanics. This is the Euler equations, which essentially relate in the acceleration of the fluid particle to the pressure gradients, with also compressible flow. These are million dollar equations, right? And I get the million dollars for writing them down, but there is a prize out there for proving regularity of these kinds of equations. In fact, it's now bestowed, but I can't do either, so it doesn't matter. The thing that interests me most is the vorticity, which is the curl of the velocity. And this evolves in time this way, with, in the inviscid case, a stretching term. So if I have vorticity, I can get a stretching amplification of vorticity. In two dimensions, this goes away. So the other thing to remind you of are what a vortex jump and a vortex sheet is. A vortex jump is just a discontinuity in velocity, which is finite. And a vortex sheet is a delta function in vorticity. So if you think about vorticity being a curl of something, a vortex sheet is a discontinuity in velocity. So velocity at this speed here, this speed there, I get a jump in it. So viscosity will kill that, will smooth it out, but an inviscid flow is okay, and vortex sheets are unstable. So Kelvin Hamhart's instability is a catastrophic short wavelength instability, which is resolved by viscosity or by surface tension. But in my case, this will occur later on, and you'll see that I managed to sidestep it. Okay, so despite the name of this workshop, I'm going to work in the linearized framework. One of my apologies for that. So I'm back to my incompressible inviscid equations. A lot, as in Stefan and Edgar's talk, I have a 2D radial swirling flow with potential actual flow going up and down. So these equations we've basically seen before today. We have pressure and so on. The basic state manifests itself by the angular velocity, the basic state vorticity, and the basic state actual velocity. If I'm two-dimensional, 
it's convenient to work in a string function vorticity language. Well, I can write the vorticity equation in this form here. The vorticity being related to the string function by essentially the Planchon operator mode m. So let me point out that I have a vertical wave number k0, the wavelength of the wave number in the vertical, and an azimuthal mode number m, which of course is quantized and is an integer. So these equations, what are their properties? So this short wave bending instability, this quantum instability, requires the presence of both strain and modes which will evolve. So the strain is quite simple to understand. The idea is that if I have a strain field, essentially the field that is pulling me apart here and pushing me in here, then if I have a vortex in the middle, I can compute the correction to the vortex at some small order delta and find out what this strain looks like in the whole flow. So that's just a mechanical problem, numerical, you write it down. I have to solve these equations here. In the steady case, it may look like cosine 2 theta at infinity. So that's just right down, numerically. Calvin mode. So this, of course, is covering a lot of material. This is basically what Stefan did talk about. And I'm going to essentially gloss over the complete WKBJ analysis and all these problems. So I call them Calvin modes because that is, he's the first person who looked at them. Sometimes people reserve that to talk about waves on the jump in vorticity. And in two dimensions, they satisfy what's called the radio rayleigh equation. That's what this is, basically, this thing down here. And you can show that in two dimensions if my basic state vorticity gradient has one sign. If this z or z prime doesn't change sign, then there are no unstable modes. So that interests me because it shows that I'm not going unstable because of these perturbations on their own. In Stefan's case, if you remember, when he had the stratification, he could, they could go unstable on their own without any strain. The Rankine vortex, which I'll discuss in a second, you can find these Kelvin modes, they're discrete normal modes. In general, if k0 is 0, if I have no vertical dependence, there are no discrete normal modes. And the continuous spectrum exists. If I have non-zero k0, then, as Stefan showed us, you can obtain these annular modes and ring modes depending on the background flow. Okay, so that, those are the two things I'm going to put together, as was done originally by the authors I mentioned. So, for general analysis, the more Saturn paper is absolutely remarkable because they're able to obtain these very general conditions from what is a, I think, a pretty tough set of equations. They essentially, technically, are working in terms of a double series. I have a small strain, I have a small perturbation in the Kelvin modes, and they're saying if I couple those together, the effect of the coupling terms is to give me an instability, which they pose in terms of resonance or solvability, and you have to compute various matrix elements. And that was first done explicitly by Tsai and Woodnall. In the absence of actual flow, you can actually show very generally this is a lot to get. So what they're showing here is the correction to the frequency. I've got some background state frequency. It's given by a quadratic in the departure of the wave number from my resonance wave number. And depending on what Q and R are, you can find stability or instability depending on the specific parameters. So that's a remarkable result. OK, that's a general result. It relies on knowing, essentially, um, I showed it down here. Cost bar neutral. No, I showed it later. I'll discuss that in a second. And this paper, this is actually in Sackman's book. You'll see we've seen this a lot of times. It's a typical example of this kind of instability. Okay, so there's an amazing paper by Yasuhide Fukumoto in 2003, and it's, I think it's remarkable, who does this program explicitly for the Rankine vortex. Every single thing is calculated. Um, the time window of things I referred to, this paper here, did it numerically. Turns out there were a couple of hiccups. And so I was inspired by it to think about this after reading this Fukumoto paper, which I thought was terrific, because the Rankine vortex is quite special. I mean, we're really able to get these results. So what about a more general profile? And what do we learn? And one of the questions is, if you think about the Rankine vortex with all these regular neutral modes, which can carefully be coupled together, what happens if I don't have a profile like that? What happens if I have a Lamassine vortex, which doesn't have regular neutral modes? So in fact, this question here was essentially posed by Yasuhide when I spoke to him a couple of years ago, and I, don't, I think he may be horrified by what I've done with it, but that was the motivation. So one of the questions then is, what is the initial value problem? I can find regular neutral modes. Are these important if I did have decaying modes? What would they do? One thing that Stefan mentioned is that you can get this wrap-up of vorticity, phase mixing, which translates itself into decay of the stream function. Even if the stream function decays, can I still trigger instability, algebraic, or exponential in the problem? The other question you might pose is, well, this double expansion due to Moore and Safman is maybe a bit restrictive. What happens if I have a non-infinitesimal strain? So that's the program. I can't spell Stefan either. That's pretty bad. Okay, so non infinitesimal strain. This is mentioned in Moore and Safman in the original paper, and they say, well, look, 
And that general F says is a non-infestable strain. That's pretty tough, but there are some special solutions. This more in Safton is the elliptic patch and strain. And also they mention an M. Hill unpublished. I'll come back to that. And people have done calculations. There's a paper by Robinson and Safman, a paper by Miyazaki et al., who actually do the calculation for a non infinitesimal strain for a vortex patch. But what I want to look at is this hill thing that they refer to in their paper. And so for that, I'm going to talk about things called hollow vortices. This is rather busy. I'll just skim over it. So what is a hollow vortex? It's a vortex that rather than having constant vorticity inside it, has constant pressure or no flow. And so if you think about it, it's a vortex sheet with this continuity and velocity at the boundary. And how many of them are known? Well, historically, there's three of them are known. And this one, I'll put dots, because I'll tell you why. But they go back a long time. They go back to the 19th century. And I'm working with Darren Crowdy on this. And they're nice, because they're exact solutions to Euler. They also tell you something about thermodynamics. If you like compressible vortex dynamics, then they have a very natural interpretation in terms of pressure. But in our case here, they're a basic state for this instability calculation. So Hill's hollow vortex, 1975. Not the same as Hill's spherical vortex, because Hill's spherical vortex is 1885. No, it's not, sorry. That's, that's Higgs. Different Hill. Um, so this, this is Hill's spherical vortex, 1890-something. So Hill was a PhD student in Imperial, and she never graduated. So that's kind of sad, but I managed to track her down. And her advisor, I'm told Derek Moore, thought she was as good as anyone out there. So she gave up science. That's a sad story. I, I keep asking, sending emails saying, can you find your notes? I want to find out what you did. Because I don't actually know what she did. I mean, she must have done this. Because Derek Moore was superb, and I'm sure she got it right. But it's a shame not to actually see the results. Mm -hmm. So we redid it from scratch, because we had no idea if she was still alive or what, who she was. We didn't know it was a she originally. This is a problem. Here's a strain field. Here's a hollow vortex. And what's the shape? I mean, we did this for n equals 2, 3, 4, 5, but n equals 2 is the relevant one. And this is a free boundary value problem. I have to find the shape as part of the solution. And I'll skip the details, which are quite lovely. And you get an explicit solution. And it's not an ellipse, right? So it's not a more sapphire type thing. It's a different shape, and n is 2 here, and there's a parameter beta, which essentially is the strain. So if beta is 0, it's a circle, and if beta is big, it gets deformed. That's what it looks like. You start off with a circle, and it gets pulled out. At some critical value, it touches itself, so you have to stop there, otherwise it becomes unphysical. This is n equals 3, where you have a sort of monkey. Some people sometimes call it a monkey stagnation flow. But the point is you can compute these explicitly, and you've got nice solutions. Not too bad. What about their stability? So we thought of that. that. So this is John work with Darren Crowdy, by the way. Um, and for the case where it's a circle, there's no strain gamma of zero, you can find the growth rates explicitly, and they're imaginary. So here's my audience participation question. And the question is, the hollow vortex is a vortex sheet on the boundary. How come the normal modes are purely imaginary, and therefore there is no kelvin Helmholtz instability? Now, I'm under time pressure here, so I've got five seconds to wait for the audience response. Edgar, I'm looking for any <laughs> suggestions? Curvature. No. Kelvin Hamilton's which exists with curvature. Next guess, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> By Kelvin Helmholtz, you mean a discontinuous? Discontinuous velocity. Yes. Exactly, yes, that's what I mean. This is a cheat, right? So By the way, the is correct, right? Is it not fit in the system? Is it, like this, this is... Okay, I'm being unfair because it's, I haven't told you exactly what I'm doing. The reason is because these basic states have constant pressure inside them, and the stability calculation I do requires constant pressure as well. Kelvin Helmholtz to exist requires pressure perturbations on both sides of the interface. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you cannot couple the motion in both domains. This does not have pressure perturbations inside, and therefore we can get Kelvin Helmholtz. And in fact, you can get this result in 2D if you say constant pressure on one side of the interface. You just get neutral traveling modes. So it's a cheap question, but this is the correct result. What you see is that mode share eigenvalues, the one and minus one mode share of zero eigenvalue, the one and four mode share an eigenvalue, and it needs to be the positive resonance between the modes in a very classical Hamiltonian. Yeah. In fact, you can show by hand that for the case we care about n equals 2, if the strain is small, you must be unstable, because think about it. If I have small strain, it looks like an intense vortex. I put an intense vortex at the center of the origin, center of the plane. If I move it away from the origin, the stagnation flow will just push it to infinity. There's nothing to bring it back. And so when you do the numerical calculation, the results are here. If this is the row we care about. We don't care about 3 and 4. The real and imaginary parts, the imaginary parts, Along the axis, these are these things I showed you before. And the real part you see as I increase mu, which essentially is the strain, you get an unstable mode here that always exists. And the dots are the asymptotic approximation. And then you see other little bubbles of instability appear as you increase mu. And I stopped here because it becomes unmanageable at this point to plot. You can't get mu bigger than a critical value, as I showed down here. And that's because physically, if you think about it, if I have too much strain, I just pull the vortex apart. It can't survive. 
This is how you do it, and this is relevant in terms of the 3D case. Um, this is a free boundary value problem, so these things are not a simple thing to write down in the z-plane. There's some implicit of this thing. It's not clear how to define a coordinate system with that. But if you look in the potential plane, it comes out quite nicely. And there's a nice transformation. You can write down your boundary conditions, kinematic and dynamic, in the potential plane. So it's a bit confusing because you're using as independent variables the background stream function and background potential, and then capital phi is your disturbance potential. It all works out. This is in Baker, Safin, and Sheffield. You get this expression. This term is related to the curvature. This is the curvature of the background state, which is not known in 2D. Now, this still doesn't work because your boundary, your shape, is still terrible in this potential plane. But if you work in the mapping plane, it all comes out very nicely in the watch. So you're working just in the zeta plane, so in the ciliary plane, everything happens inside a circle, and your boundary conditions, essentially for the potential and the disturbance, become this. And that's how I, I solve to get this result, because in my problem over here, everything's harmonic inside. So I just have Fourier series inside the circle. So that's what I did with Darren. Now the 3D case. In 3D, you have a vertical wave number k0. And so your equation is no longer Laplace's equation. It has a minus k0 squared term. You can still do the mapping from z to zeta because of this nice result. And this is the result you get in the zeta plane. So inside my circle, this is what I find. Z prime I know, z prime, I'm sorry, in Canada, because it's just this thing with the mod squared. And so I just have to solve this numerically to find what's happening. You can add a vertical velocity, the actual velocity, turns out that in the basic state it must be the same as string function, because otherwise it wouldn't satisfy the vertical momentum equation, and your boundary condition generalizes, but I'm not going to worry about what W is. I'm just going to show you some results. So here we go. So this is the case with just the vortex column. So K0 is the wave number, and you can see along this axis some very nice twos and fours and things like that before. We had that before. Those are just these guys. You can see as I change K, my modes go through each other. But this is always stable. There's no instability. And this, you can compute explicitly, but I just haven't bothered to do it. What I'm going to plot now are the instability for various values of K0 when I change the disturbance, the amount of strain. And this is a vortex column with 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 in the imaginary part. So you can see that I start off every time with some bunch of frequencies. But I always start with instability here because I'm inside. What I'm doing is propagating this figure out towards you. So I'm going at point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3. You can see I already have instability at these values of mu. And so you can see that the growth rate omega is non-zero along mu equals zero. You can see I have growth rates. I go to zero little bubbles and so on. You can see the lovely little crossing bubbles and then avoided crossings in the system. So we can do this. And to a certain extent, you might argue the Hill vortex is not that important. I'd say that from a historical point of view, it's kind of nice to actually do what once that mentioned. Also, this general technique can be applied to any free boundary value solution, provided you can control the irrotationality of it. You know, so if it's irrotational, I can have whatever shape I want. This approach will work, and numerically it's quite simple. OK, I'm running out of time, aren't I? Initial value problem. So what happens if I try to see the initial value problem in time, I can work in terms of Laplace transforms. It all works out. The strain correction I mentioned before, this is what it looks like explicitly. So for example, for the lambda scene vortex, where this is the vorticity, this is your correction. So that's not very difficult. Kelvin modes. So the Kelvin modes now become <coughs> time dependent. And to solve this problem, an initial condition will cause us some worries in a minute. So this is what you have to solve. So you just have to have a way of numerically solving that LM. This is a function S, and you have to have a decent way of doing inverse Laplace transforms. And this technology exists for that. And this is the crux of the matter with resonant terms. I've gone back to my theta R notation because I want to see the nonlinearity, but I don't want to lose terms of complex conjugates. So you can see the operator acting on, on the stream function psi. This is the forcing terms. And the strain, which is like cosine 2 theta, couples modes M and M plus 2. So if I look at the minus 1 1 case, I can do everything in terms of the mode 1. And these are the coupling terms in terms of the, stri the straining function and the Kelvin function. So to solve that numerically, before I do that, I'd like to mention one thing which is maybe not as well known as it should be. You can do this all explicitly for the minus 1 plus 1 resonance. There's an exact solution for the radio Rayleigh equation in time for modes m equals plus and minus 1. You start off with this, which is what it is. You do a plus transform in time, and then you do a trick. 
and you get quadrature immediately. This goes back to work by Smith and Rosenblatt. It's related to things called ghost on bosons and shifting the origin, which is not necessarily relevant, but the important thing is there is an exact result, and I can write everything down for me. So for the minus 1, 1 resonance, you can do the entire initial value problem by hand. You then have to look at this and do your asymptotics for the function g, which may not be trivial, but formally you've done it. It's nice to check my old, this is from my thesis, so I feel quite nostalgic about this. You actually check that the result works. You, you find from asymptotics that if I switch on an arbitrary perturbation, mode 1 will tend to this result. And so you can check it. I start off with the blue line, and I tend to the dashed black line, and I was very happy with that. I was impressed that my thesis was correct, right? How many people can say that? And this is just a numerical result. Okay, so I'm running out of time. I assume I'm running out of time. So this is just what happens if you solve it numerically. The interesting bit now is what, what this means, and I haven't done that bit yet. For example, this dashed black line is the exact <coughs> solution for this mode. These dashed and solid curves are the actual results I get from this resonance. And so I do appear to be to get growth, whether it's transient, exponential, algebraic. I haven't done that yet. OK, and the 3D problem is the next step. So I'm going to conclude now because I want to show some pretty pictures afterwards. OK, hollow vortices, we found them with Darren. We found this to be in two dimensions. And now we've done three dimensions. And that is something you could do for more general problems. For example, things called Sadovsky vortices and also the addition of surface tension. So this instability over here, I'm going to see sick, uh, over here, may be a bit of a worry because why should that, is, if that instability is not really important for the shape. It's to do with the center. So maybe we can abolish that with surface tension. And then finally, initial value problem, one can actually calculate the strain mode and the Kelvin mode explicitly, well, numerically, and then the resonance I've done, well, you can see how to do it, and then you can interpret it. So to finish, the last two minutes, Dolphins, right? So let me show another movie. Some of you may have seen this before. Who's seen this video? So these are dolphins in an aquarium. And they do this. They create these vortex rings. And they play with them. And they appear to control them. They appear to be able to see how it creates that. You now what's amazing about that, look at the size of that thing and the diameter. It's incredibly stable. So I don't know whether he is controlling it ultrasonically. Presumably, they, it may be. No one knows whether they actually use sound to play with them. But they're very, very stable. Yeah. And he can pitch them off. He can do reconnection of his teeth. Look at this. Is that on this one? Uh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> and there's a whole bunch of these videos on the internet. Right? Yeah. Cool. They're absolutely amazing. <laughs> it looks better on my screen, so I'm sorry if this makes it for you. OK, that's enough for those pictures. So they're not trained to do that. No, they learn they to do it for fun. They don't think you have to be bored to do something. Oh, <laughs> 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 Sorry, Sorry. 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 Some of the 3D diagrams you plotted look like you have intersectional eigenvalues mm -hmm. on the imaginary axis. We are actually making the bubble. Uh, the the bubble is right let's see. Each other. This one? No, no, the one previous. Uh, the, the this one here? Yeah. That's all stable. Those are all. Those yeah, so it's all stable. So they're passing stable. each other, but there's no back It's completely stable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no stability. And I mean, so, okay, let, let me sort of tell you my guilty secret that I've never ever computed crime signatures. <laughs> because I always solve these numerically, and computing signatures is extremely painful. It's much harder than computing the actual no. switching problem. It's well, for me it is. For me it is. <laughs> it Maybe you can teach me problem. to do it better. On the other hand, yeah, I mean, the, this, this is purely stable, the system. There's no space. The addition of strain makes it unstable. This is, the, this is addition of strain, basically. You can see the instability created. Uh, pardon me. Previous one is no strain? This is no strain. That's right. This is a circle, circular yeah. hollow vortex. Mm. There's no density. Yeah. So this uh, strain uh, gives uh, perturbations, yes. symmetry breaking. Yeah, that's right. The strain couples the. That, that's uh, that this uh, perturbation feeds energy to the perturbation. Yes. Again, I, I haven't done an energy analysis, yes. but that's right. It's, 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 it's. I could ask a quick question. Uh, when you mentioned the, the, the continuous profile of the Lamo scene vortex. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. it's, uh, Stefan de Dizest talked about the critical point That's singularities. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about what effect? No, uh, I, I haven't uh, here. Uh, um, the, most of what I showed is, well, this is not the uh, Lamassine vortex. No. Uh, absolutely not. This, this is, of course, so this is the strain, so this is just regular boring. And then this analysis here is where the critical layers would be. They'd be sitting while they'd be living in the null space of this guy here. And now I'm talking about that. I got no viscosity here anyway, and then, yeah, they don't have viscosity either. I don't. Thanks again for a very entertaining talk. Thank you for this time. <laughs> Williams took away two minutes from you. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I'll give you back your two minutes.